from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good morning and welcome to the second of the eight lectures in our series this year. I am Nanette Gibbs from the Library Science, Technology, and Business Division. Today we'll hear about NASA's mission to send groups of astronauts, engineers, and scientists to live and work in Aquarius, an undersea research station off the coast of Key Largo. Crew members encounter conditions and challenges similar to what they might experience on asteroids, our moon, or on Mars. They are able to simulate living on a spacecraft and can test and develop tools and techniques for future space missions. Dr. Young, who is a research scientist and planetary geologist, is a graduate of McLean High School <laughs> and earned a BS in environmental geosciences from Notre Dame and an MS and PhD in geological sciences from Arizona State University. She spoke here last October on developing tools and training astronauts for planetary surface exploration. Please help me welcome Kelsey Young back to the library. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Annette, and thanks to the library for having me back a second time. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about NEMO today, which is NASA's underwater analog project. Um, but first, um, I was going to introduce myself, but um, Nanette pretty much covered that. So I am a um, field geologist, and I do field geology here on Earth to prepare for when human beings go back beyond low Earth orbit. Um, so I spend a lot of time out in analog environments. I just got back about 36 hours ago from California, where I was doing field work with this instrument here. Um, so we're testing instruments and operational concepts for human beings when they go and conduct science on other planetary surfaces. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about solar system exploration and the role that um, the NEMO project in particular will play in it. So here's our solar system. Um, human beings have never ventured beyond um, our planet and its moon, um, but we have sent um, orbiters, rovers, and landers out to the far reaches of the solar system. Uh, most recently, the New Horizons mission went out even past the end of our solar system, and just last week, um, Cassini actually went through Saturn's rings. Um, so there's a lot going on in solar system exploration, but what I want to focus on today is, is human exploration in particular. So we've only ever sent human beings beyond our planet on six different missions from 1969 to 1972. Uh, Twelve people walked on the surface of the moon, collecting samples, deploying surface size, uh, science experiments, and on the later three missions, actually using the lunar roving vehicle pictured here to travel even farther away from where they landed. Um, the scientific experiments they were doing were pretty basic. Um, they were using basic tools like rakes, shovels, scoops um, to collect and store samples for return to Earth, and those samples are still being studied today at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and then they also deployed science experiments like basic seismic packages to look at the seismic structure of the upper lunar crust. Um, and the lunar roving vehicle was used to transport all of these samples and experiments as well as store samples to bring back to the lander. Um, to do this, to practice for what they were going to be doing during Apollo, um, the 12 Apollo astronauts who actually ended up walking on the moon spent a great deal of time learning geology and field testing technology that they were going to use on Apollo. Um, geologists like to say that the Apollo astronauts essentially had earned the equivalent of a master's degree in geology by the time they flew to the moon. Um, so they really knew what they were doing. They were highly trained by a group of um, skilled field geologists. And so they learned about geology in analog sites here on Earth. And then they also field tested the technology that they were going to use once they got to the surface of the moon. So this is the Apollo 17 crew actually using the cameras and technology that they'd, they'd eventually use during Apollo 17, as well as doing things like testing the suits and the lunar roving vehicle um, in relevant environments to the landing site that they were going to be visiting. Um, so this idea of field testing technology and preparation for exploration has been around a long time and it was incredibly successful in the Apollo generation. Uh, in fact, the Apollo astronauts who received the most training toward the later Apollo missions were actually incredibly successful in collecting samples that are a really robust part of um, the lunar science community today. Um, today, we continue that tradition of testing technologies and operational procedures in relevant environments. Here are just some of the environments that we're working on today. Um, we have aquatic, terrestrial, and laboratory environments. 
Um, for aquatic, I'll talk to you today a lot about the NEMO um, experiment, but we also have the Neutral Buoyancy Lab at, at the Johnson Space Center where um, there's full-size mock-ups of the International Space Station for the astronauts to actually practice EVAs or spacewalks on. Um, ESA, the European Space Agency, also has their own Neutral Buoyancy facility. Um, terrestrially, we do a lot. Um, here is a, another analog project um, similar to NEMO called Desert Rats, where rovers actually drive around um, in el analog environments to prepare for when we're back on, on either the moon or Mars. Um, we actually train astronauts in relevant um, field areas, just like we did in Apollo. Um, so we take out all the astronauts today into places like New Mexico and Arizona to train them for what they're going to be viewing from orbit and what they're hopefully going to be seeing when they go um, past low Earth orbit. Um, and we also go to extreme environments from Antarctica up to the, to the Arctic to test procedures and learn about processes that shape other planetary surfaces. In the laboratory, we have um, things like the Argos environment, the active response gravity offload system, which actually simulates what it's like to work in uh, lower gravity than here on Earth. Um, we use virtual reality and hybrid reality um, to actually immerse ourselves in environments like we see on other planets so we can actually put ourselves on Mars um, and offload our gravity to experience what it would be like on Mars to simulate what astronauts are really going to be feeling once they get there. Um, and then we have the International Space Station. So human beings are living every day up in space, uh, a couple hundred miles above our heads, and that's a really robust laboratory to learn what it's like to work in microgravity. Um, so we're learning about the health effects of long-term space flight, which is going to be really important on, on the journey to Mars. Um, and the ISS is, is the most robust laboratory environment we have to really prepare for long-term space flight. Um, but what we really want to spend um, a lot of time doing and what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of today um, are conducting highly integrated operational tests. So what I mean by that is um, operational tests sort of combine science, operations, and equipment or technology together in a mission-like environment to really simulate what it's going to be like um, to be on the moon or Mars. Um, so the types of things that we're evaluating in these operational tests include concept of operations. So what is it actually going to look like when human beings are operating on the surface? Uh, during Apollo, we had two human beings operating together at one time. Um, for three of the six missions, they had the lunar roving vehicle. When we go back beyond Earth, things are not going to look the same. Um, technology's come a long way. Operational concepts have come a, long, come a long way. And we need to practice to understand what these operational concepts are going to look like when we, when we um, hopefully head back to the moon. Um, we also want to test relevant hardware and tools for both pioneering and science tasks. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm a geologist. I'm looking forward to when astronauts bring back samples from other planets. So that's sort of a science task, similar to what the Apollo guys were doing. So they were actually picking up rocks based on their geology training and returning them to Earth. We're also going to have pioneering tasks. So what I mean by that um, is basically if we have long-term space flight and human beings are living on another planetary surface for longer than the couple days they were there on Apollo, they'll have pioneering tasks to get ready for that long-term habitation. So they'll set up habitats, they'll set up communication structures, um, they're depo they'll deploy um, sort of weather monitoring stations on the surface of Mars. So we need to simulate what those pioneering tasks looks like, look like now because we've never done that on another planetary surface. Um, so we need to test the relevant hardware and technology that they're going to be using when, they, when, they, um, when they're doing that. And we also want to look at the tools and techniques that enable the communication between Earth, which will have a mission control center, MCC, and a science team, just like they had on Apollo, and the crew. And something I'm going to talk a lot about today is um, sort of the difference between IV and EV crew. So EVA is an extravehicular activity spacewalk. It's um, what the Apollo astronauts did when they spent, you know, eight hours at a time roving over the lunar surface. Um, we're hoping we'll get, you know, more than two crew members to, alert, to another surface in the future. And if that's the case, we'll likely have an IV crew member or an intervehicular activity crew member who's sitting inside a habitat and helping to um, get eyes on an EVA and, and sort of quarterback the EVA. So I'll talk about that later in the context of NEMO. Um, but we want to sort of stress these tools and techniques that are going to enable this communication between Earth and the supporting teams and the crew who are actually doing the science. Um, and we want to do this over an appropriate communication delay. Um, so Mars is far enough away that when you send up a communication to Mars, it's going to take a long time for it to get there. It doesn't get there right away. Um, so actually a communication loop between if I am sitting here on Earth sending a communication to somebody on Mars, it's going to take as much as 30 minutes to get there and back. Um, so if you say, oh, wow, I see this amazing rock in your video screen, you know, that was 15 minutes ago, right? So you need to understand how to flex the scientific operations over this long communication delay. And what we want to do is do that using a flexible execution methodology. 
And what we mean by that, and I'll talk about that a lot in this talk, um, is basically you, you go in with a traverse plan. Um, the Apollo astronauts had their eight hours pretty much um, scripted, and they knew exactly where they were going to go, when they were going to go there. Um, what we want to do is give astronauts the technology and the training to be able to actually flexibly execute those traverses. So if they're driving down the dotted line on their traverse map, but they see something to the left off the traverse map, we want them to be able to be empowered to go and investigate it. Um, the extreme example we use if, is um, if an astronaut's on Mars and they're on this traverse path and they see a dinosaur bone off to the left that's not on the traverse path, we want them to turn left and pick up the bone, right? Um, so that's sort of <laughs> flexible execution. So we call it flexicuting a traverse plan. Um, so I'll talk a lot about that um, today with Nemo. So basically all of this together, we want to combine science, operations, and technology in a mission-like environment. So to do this, we go out in the field. We go out in relevant analog environments. Um, so these analog missions allow for really early end-to-end -end testing of operational concepts and hardware. Um, so these are just a couple examples of the analog missions NASA's run. Here's NEMO, which I'll talk a lot about. Um, here are those Desert Rats missions where we simulated um, being on the surface of the moon. And the types of things we're doing are we're evaluating objectives that map to specific knowledge or technology gaps. So we're not ready to go to Mars. NASA is not ready to send humans to Mars. We have knowledge and technology gaps before we can get there. Analog missions are hoping to close some of these knowledge and technology gaps. We want to put the crew in a flight-like environment and also the ground team in a flight-like environment. Um, so it's not just the crew that's going to be involved in exploration. It's all of us here on Earth, and we need to be trained for that. Um, we, we, th these types of operational tests, they drive out results that aren't found when you're just testing one tool or one technique at a time. You need to really put this in a robust stressing environment that's going to stress the entire system and stress the participants involved. Um, and this has benefits right now on ISS. Um, I'll talk to you about this, but last year we were deploying experiments on ISS that a couple months later were, or, excuse me, deploying experiments in NEMO that a couple months later were deployed on ISS. Um, so the types of testing we're doing in these analog missions have, you know, current relevance to ISS as well as to NASA's future exploration goals. So a bit of an eye chart, but this is just to show you um, the types of things that, that we're doing to prepare for, for hopefully sending humans to Mars and the types of experience that, that teams working here on Earth have. So Apollo is a big part of our experience. You know, we learned a lot from the Apollo missions. Um, there are still people that, that I work with today that were around in the Apollo age, but that's not going to continue forever. These people are retiring. Um, so we need to learn all we can now from the people who, who really did this, the only time we've ever sent human beings to another surface. We have Mars robotic missions. So we have two functioning rovers on the surface of Mars right now. Um, they're obviously not human beings, but they require constant, constant supervision and sending up new traverse plans every day. There are Mars rover planners working every day to develop the new um, ops plans for the two rovers that are up there now. And that's under this communication delay. So right now we're learning how to do science under a communication delay, and it's incredibly valuable experience. We have NEMO, which I'll talk about, that's been run since the early 2000s. We have the Desert Rats rover missions, which similar to NEMO, but above water. Um, we have a number of science field campaigns and other relevant environments that are, that are um, considerably smaller in scale than NEMO. Uh, I just got back from one of them a couple days ago. So all of these things together are really, we're hoping, going to together prepare us for, for hopefully putting boots on the ground on Mars. But NEMO. Um, the rest of the day I'm going to talk about the NEMO analog project in particular. NEMO stands for the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Test. It's been run uh, in the Aquarius habitat since the early 2000s. Um, and it's run through the Aquarius Reef Base Facility that's run by Florida International University. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about the Aquarius Reef Base Facility and then sort of jump into the recent NEMO missions and sort of what we're, what we're learning today and, and um, what we'll deploy in NEMO 22 in a couple of months. Um, so this is the shore facility that we use for the NEMO tests. Um, it's located in Isla Morada, Florida, in the Florida Keys. Um, so sort of all the operation centers are in this building. Um, there's a watch desk, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, where whenever a crew is in saturation in the habitat, there's somebody sitting at the watch desk 24-7 to monitor the health of the habitat and the health of the crew. Um, there's a mission control center where the NASA team sets up to sort of pretend like we're in the mission control center in Houston. Um, and there's a number of um, dive lockers for the support staff that support the crew in saturation. So here's sort of a map um, of the Florida Keys. Um, like I said, the Mission Control Center in the building on the previous slide is run by FIU, Florida International University, and it's about an hour and a half south of Miami. Here's the watch desk that's, that's again, manned 24-7, and it's situated right here on one of these canals, the ARB facility. Um, if you just go six miles offshore, you get to the Aquarius habitat, which is pictured here. 
Um, so this is sort of a model of Aquarius reef base itself. Um, the bottom of the habitat sits, sits at 62 and 62 feet of water, but the bottom of the habitable volume, which is here, um, sits at a little shallower at 50 feet. So this is the, this, these are the dimensions of the habitable volume, um, nine feet in diameter and 43 feet long. And here's sort of a um, sketch of um, the volume that the crew, the crew spends all of their time in. Um, so they basically um, come in through the wet porch. They just swim down and up into the, into the habitat. And this is sort of the size of the space that they're living in, sort of like a big RV. So they have sort of um, areas to do science experiments. They have a dining room table to eat dinner at. Um, and then they have bunks back here, as well as several viewports where they can actually, you know, look outside at, at what's around them, including one at the back right by their beds. Um, so here's a view from the bunk room looking sort of down looking um, from the bunks down this way. Um, so here's the outside of the hab, and this is the viewport that they can see from their beds, and, and here, are the, here are the bunks themselves. There are six bunks, three on each side. Um, and here's just some pictures to give you an idea of what it looks like inside Aquarius. Um, we've got sort of, uh, it's a very small working space, um, and they can, you know, sort of eat and do science on either side of it. This is the wet porch that they can swim up and in. Um, and in general, it's, it's a lot like, um, you know, living on the International Space Station. It's, it's a cramped environment. You're in there with a lot of people. So hopefully you, you know, you get along with the other five people in the habitat. <laughs> Um, here are the onshore facilities that we have, uh, that, that um, ARB, the ARB facility has. Um, there's a fleet of boat, boats to take divers to and from the dive site. Um, there's the NASA office and the Mission Control Center, like I mentioned, um, internet, conference, meeting area, labs, you know, computers, um, a workshop area in case, you know, they actually need to machine anything, um, dive lockers, a rest area, and they actually have a hyperbaric chamber and safety equipment in case of um, an uh, incident or accident happening during a mission, which has never happened, not to worry. Um, and there's also a life support buoy out at the site itself. So Aquarius sits underwater underneath the life support buoy. Uh, it's got generators, compressors, communications to, to beam back the comms from the crew directly to the facility on shore. Um, and again, it sits directly above the habitat. And here's a human up here for scale. Um, so Aquarius sits in the Carpenter Basin. Um, so Aquarius is actually labeled AQ right here. That's where the habitat is. And this is just to give you an idea of the scale of the sort of the exploration area of the crew during a mission. Um, these are all sort of landmarks that the team has worked out over a number of years. Um, some of these are sampling sites from previous NEMO missions, which I'll talk about. Um, but this, this data or this map is overlain on um, bathymetry data, so you can actually see the sort of um, dimensions of the bottom of the seafloor here. You can see sort of lots of striations in the floor, and that's actually, um, you know, coral features that are on the bottom of the seafloor, which is actually what the astronauts are um, exploring when they're out on simulated EVA. So all of this together really enables NASA to operate in a high fidelity environment. Um, so we can test operational concepts and procedures in a space-like environment. Um, we can play with usability and design trade-offs. So um, it enables us to be in an environment where we can really test different types of technology year after year after year and experiment with the trade-offs that are involved with one technology over another. Um, it enables us to build up a workforce that's knowledgeable and experienced in this type of exploration, which is really, really important as we, you know, hopefully build past um, the Earth. Um, it builds these workforce knowledge gaps, like I said earlier, on how to execute really complex operational procedures. Um, and it, it has early and relevant end operator input. So the astronauts are the ones that are going to be out on these other planets doing exploration and it enables these people, these astronauts, to get in this habitat and get their hands on developing technology. Um, so it gets them experience, but it also enables them to give us experience. Um, so if there's a technology that they really just don't like or don't think is going to work in spaceflight, this is a way for us to work that out early rather than when, um, you know, we're on our way to Mars. Um, and lastly, and I think it's really important, it's a proven PAO tool, um, outre a public outreach tool for keeping the public inspired and engaged in space exploration. Um, we may not have humans beyond um, Earth and ISS right now, but we are working toward, you know, sending humans, putting boots on the ground on Mars. And it's really important that the public be engaged in that effort. So diving into NEMO 21, <laughs> diving puns. <laughs> um, so NEMO 21 was this past year in 20, 2016. Um, the mission was actually 16 days long, living and working in the um, Aquarius Reef Base facility. Um, we had completed a variety of objectives, which I'll talk to you on the next slide. Um, we had an international crew, um, which actually the, uh, part of the crew rotated out mid-mission. Um, so here, here are the crew here. We had um, Americans, um, one from South Africa, one from Germany, and one from Ireland. 
Um, so we had an engineering week where we actually tested a lot of the technology that we were going to be using during the mission. So that was well in advance of the mission to sort of iterate on any um, design requirements that needed to be changed. Um, we had a crew training week at the Johnson Space Center where all the crew members flew to Houston um, and enabled all of the uh, mission operators to train them on the types of technology they were going to be using. Um, we had a test readiness review, which is actually where we sit with the safety officers at the Johnson Space Center to make sure everyone's comfortable with, with um, putting these, these test subjects in this environment. Um, we had a training week actually down in Florida just the week before the mission to, you know, get hands-on training and, and teach the divers, um, teach the crew members how to do saturation diving. And then we had the mission, which was 16 days long. So I want to talk to you about the science and operations and technology advancements from the mission. Do not worry about reading the slide. Um, this is just to show all the partners that we had for the mission. So a really unique and exciting thing about NEMO is that, you know, it's, it's run by NASA at NASA, but um, we have a lot of external partners that enables a big part of the community to get involved. Um, and that's contributed a lot to the success of this program. Um, so this is just a graphic to show you all the partners that we had involved in this mission. And I'll talk about the contributions from several of them um, over, over the course of this talk. But um, suffice it to say, we had a lot of NASA centers involved. Um, we had PIs from different research institutions involved. We had several academic institutions, um, private research institutions. We had the military involved. And we had a number of different contributors from industry across the country. So our science objectives, um, I'll, I'll give a high level overview and then I'll dive into a little bit of detail there. Um, one of our objectives was nursery construction and science. And I'll talk about that in the next couple slides, but um, we partnered with the Coral Restoration Foundation, which is a nonprofit based in the Keys that's actually working on exploring why corals are dying off. You might've heard in the news, there are corals all over the world, including the Great Barrier Reef that are really struggling. Um, so the Coral Restoration Foundation is, is, is trying to understand why this is happening and, and, and um, perhaps more importantly, figure out how to repopulate some of these reefs. Um, so NEMO has a big part in that research, and I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, we have follow-up science, and that's because, um, you know, NASA's been working in this area for a number of years. Specifically in NEMO 20 was the first year that we had really integrated science objectives, coral science objectives, with the NEMO program. Um, so the crew in NEMO 20 back in 2015 collected a bunch of samples, um, and we went back in NEMO 21 to investigate how those sites have changed over time. Um, we also had new exploration. So this is sort of an exploration zone map of the Carpenter Basin around Aquarius. We had five exploration zones that the crew could go in. And those are sort of just, um, those exploration zones were defined so that, you know, both the um, ground control team and the crew could sort of reference something on a map and have something to track back to for mission planning. Um, so now, um, through from NEMO 20 to NEMO 21 last year, through NEMO 22 this year, we have really authentic, robust coral science that's fully integrated into NEMO EVA operations. So that's, that's really exciting. It's something, um, you know, the NEMO team is really proud of. Um, and we're doing this under, um, you know, a lot of hours of EVA. So we had over 60 hours of science-based EVA last year, and we were able to get a lot of really exciting coral science done. Um, so here's the Coral Restoration Foundation. Um, again, they're a nonprofit organization, and they're dedicated to creating and maintaining these offshore nurseries um, for threatened coral species. Um, so they want to build these coral um, nurseries and restoration techniques and understand what the best way is to restore these reefs and empower others and train others to do the same thing around the world. Um, so here are ty some of the types of um, uh, nurseries that CRF is, is working with, and they're spread over a, a number of different locations. And I'll talk to you specifically about the, the nursery work that's going on in the Nemo area. Um, so for Nemo, um, we work extensively with CRF. Um, CRF is able to um, prepare the astronauts, process the corals, um, train the astronauts, and train the ground control team to support, to support the mission. Um, so the corals are actually put on these little sort of like credit card or playing card sized little um, pieces of, of plastic. And they're um, sort of cultivated in the CRF facility in the Keys. Um, this is actually Ken Niedemeyer who, who runs CRF. Um, and he, he's a big partner of NEMO. Um, and we've, we've really enjoyed working with CRF. And so here they are sort of training the crew um, in the onshore facility on how to actually physically construct the trees. Because in NEMO 21, the crews actually took these cards that the coral scientists prepared and mounted them on the coral trees themselves underwater, where they've been since last August. Um, so once the sort of the cards were constructed and the crew was trained, um, we had to physically transport them to the site. So took them out on a boat um, and put them put them here in these sort of milk crates here. And the crew actually took them to the two sites um, designated in the Carpenter Basin and deployed five of these trees at each site. 
Um, and each tree has 100 coral cards on it. So we really do have a lot of coral colony or um, coral species growing underwater now. And it's, it's, they've been under there for almost a year. So this year we're going to be able to go back and see how they're doing. Um, so these are just some of the process of the crew last year actually um, setting up the um, setting up the nurseries and one of the cool fun facts um, from last year that um, we actually on purpose did not tell the crew until the day of this relevant EVA but they built the deepest coral nursery in the world last year um, so it's really exciting and they're comparison they're comparing the, um, the the coral scientists are comparing the shallow nurseries and the deep nurseries to compare which species grow the best at which depths and in which water conditions so then we actually wanted to conduct science and operations on the nursery. So here's Ken and our science team, Mission Control. This is the science team here in our little trailer outside in the parking lot of the onshore facility. Um, and so they're actually, they, they, they mounted all the coral cards and then took pictures of all of them so the coral scientists back in the trailer could evaluate which corals even survived the trip because corals are fragile. That's, the, you know, one of the reasons we're in this, this situation. We wanted to make sure that that journey out to Aquarius and underwater, um, they made it through so that a year from now we'll know that any of the corals who died off actually occurred in the year since they were planted, not the initial effort of getting them out there. Um, so for marine exploration science, science, we've partnered with the Images Lab at FIU. Um, so it's the um, Integrative Marine Genomics and Symbiosis Lab at FIU, um, just a really robust coral science facility. Um, and they have a lot of science objectives. Um, we've partnered with them since NEMO 20, um, and they're doing real science on these coral colonies with the samples that the NEMO crews are collecting. Um, so in NEMO 20, they were sampling the Sideroastria type of coral. I've learned a lot about coral in the last couple years. Um, and then in NEMO 21, they were looking at the Agaricea species and the Orbicella species, as well as, again, um, actually doing some science on the coral colonies themselves. Um, so they want to genetically characterize the types of corals from the depths that they're, um, that they're collected from. Um, they want time and depth constraints. So precisely when they were collected and from what depth is really important when you're thinking about coral science. So um, we have to train the crew to, to really pay attention to their depth gauges and making sure that the corals they're collecting um, are at relevant depths for the science team. Um, and we want to provide a natural baseline for those coral restoration efforts. So um, they're exploring the local corals to figure out how they might relate to, to, the, to the corals that are on the nurseries. Um, and so this, this ultimately they want to influence and <clears throat> inform the coral restoration efforts, as well as understanding this, you know, really um, this reef environment that's, that's really in flux. Um, so that's sort of the science we're doing, um, but moving on to the science operations, so what it's actually like to conduct science in this relevant environment. Um, again, I'll go into a couple, uh, into detail about some of these, but we looked at integrated EVA science operations, so what the communication structure between a crew on EVA, their supporting crew member who's sitting inside the habitat, the mission control center, and the science team back on Earth. So that's, you know, four variables who, you know, all want to get their opinions heard. So flexing this communication structure um, became, you know, really important to test. And um, you know, last year in EMO 21, we did this under a 15-minute one-way communication delay. Um, so again, if I'm sitting in the science trailer and I send a communication to the crew, um, it gets there 15 minutes later, they read it, they have to send a response, and 15 minutes later I see that response. So we're flexing this communication structure under this, um, this um, high communication latency. Um, so then we had navigation, map, and traverse planning obje science uh, operations objectives that we are testing. We use different navigation technologies as well as crew training um, and uh, sort of IT assets to have actually on EVA. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, just to briefly mention, um, we had an optimal optical communications experiment deployed by a student group from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University with us last year. Um, and we had a uh, remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, um, from the Naval Postgraduate School that was also tested last year. Um, but to dive into this sort of communication structure a little bit more, um, this is sort of just a, an image to show, um, you know, here's us in the science trailer last year who were actually communicating directly with the intravehicular, the IV crew member here, which I'll talk about in a bit, who then could communicate with the EV crew member. Um, and things to think about is that you know, there's a communication delay between science team and Ivy, but there's no communication delay between the habitat and the people who are boots on the ground. Um, so experimenting with this communication delay, where it occurs and where it matters, um, became, became really important. And developing the, the technology to support that delay, to support communication over the delay, um, is, is something that's, that's um, iteratively tested from, from year to year with Nemo. 
Um, so our objectives with looking at this integrated um, science operation structure last year were just to figure out how this works, operate it under a communication delay. Um, and there are definitely kinks, but that those kinks are results, right? Um, so we want to determine what functions and capabilities are needed by every part of that communications loop to enable them to do their job. For example, um, this IV person, uh, one of the things we found was they are very busy. They are extremely busy. They have mission control and science team saying, ooh, you know, go collect that coral. That was great. And mission control saying, okay, EVA, one hour left. You got to hurry up. Um, and then you have the EV crew streaming back all this data to them that they're trying to keep control of and manage. Um, so giving them the, the technology that they need to manage all of those different variables um, is one of the, one of the main takeaways um, from Nemo. And then one of the other things that I mentioned earlier is this flex execution idea. Um, flex execution, it sounds sort of straightforward, flexible execution, not something that NASA has really done before. We operate under scripted timelines um, and being able to go to NASA and say, you know, scientists really need astronauts to be able to be flexible is like this whole new language. Um, but it's a language we're starting to learn and we're starting to understand. Um, so, so this is, you know, something I, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about, and I think it's, it sounds straightforward, but it's definitely a big hurdle. Um, but it's an exciting one, I think. Um, so the takeaways from, from this sort of, um, study last year was that we successfully exercised these full comm loops with passing a bunch of data back and forth, um, communications, but from the crew to the science team and, and back to the EV via the IV, we sort of stressed this whole loop over the 16 day mission and really felt like we had a number of situations that presented themselves where we got to stress that system and, and you know, and put it under pressure a little bit, which is, which is important in, in tests like this. Um, and so we also observe the criticality of these flex execution flight rules. So, um, being able to be flexible is important and training a crew so that they feel confident, confident enough in the science to be flexible, um, is, is important. And it's something we did last year in Nemo. Um, but we also want to have flight rules, right? Like unbreakable rules that no matter what, no matter if there's a dinosaur bone over there, there are rules that you cannot break, right? So developing those flight rules is really important. And, and it's something that we'll certainly have, you know, nailed down when we send human beings beyond earth. Um, so another um, objective we had was, again, assessing the tools and technology needs, and this includes both hardware and software. So the tools that the astronaut are, are actually holding, what that, what that hardware looks like, as well as what's displayed on, on screens and things like that. Um, so we're assessing the tools needs for both short distance navigation from site to site to site um, to support this type of um, geology, or in this case, coral science. Um, so the takeaways are that um, the crew successfully used digital maps, um, digital traverse plans, and an active system to locate pertinent sampling zones. So they had this, this navigation equipment they were using, and they also had um, basically an underwater iPad that they were able to actually view traverse plans with and, and sampling procedures with. So um, here's a traverse for one of the days last year that they are actually able to navigate with underwater. Um, so they were actually able to successfully do that. Um, but one of the key lessons learned for, for us on the shore um, side of things, the science team side of things, is under this sort of time latent um, planning cycle, so with a high communications delays, we need to make sure that we update the plan, we keep them apprised as our plans evolve from one day to the next in a timely manner so that they can sit down before they go EVA and say, okay, here's the plan, we know this plan is not going to change. Here's the flight rules. Here's the traverse plan. If we see this, we deviate from the traverse plan, but only if it's in within the you know, So though they have to have that information with enough time um, to feel confident that the crew can, that can really eff effectively and efficiently operate the plan. Um, so technology too, um, sort of similar to, to the last slide I just talked about, but um, what we were looking at is digital cue cards. So here's that underwater iPad we were testing, and they were actually able to pull up all sorts of things on these underwater iPads, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the IV support system, like I mentioned, it was really important to give the IV person the assets they needed to be successful in a, in a really busy position. Um, we also had science sampling tools and a geology sampling kit that the EVA tools group at the Johnson Space Center is developing. Um, so they tested that extensively at NEMO as well last year. Um, so here's sort of the digital cue card. Um, they had mission maps. They had the images and traverse plans. They had the marine science procedures as well as um, sort of a guide to help them identify coral. They had procedures for how to build the coral nurseries. They had procedures for how to operate the, um, that sampling kit I just mentioned, procedures for optical comm, a list of equipment and how to use it, um, and then a number of sort of operationally minded things to, 
to enable them to flip back and forth between all of those all of those assets. So they had procedures that they could they could pull up. This is the geoscience sampling procedure that with one click of a button they can get there on the underwater iPad. Um, and so that enables them to to really pull up what they need at a drop of a hat. Um, it also implies that they're highly trained in how to use the iPad, which is really important. Um, but we were able to really operate these digital cue cards um, effectively, and the crew had a lot of really solid feedback that said it was really helpful for them to say, okay, if it's this type of coral, we want to sample with this specific technology, and here's the procedure for how to do that. Um, toward the end of the mission, they didn't need those procedures as much, but in the beginning, it really helped them sort of refresh their memory from the training they got from the, from the coral scientists. Um, and if there was a particularly complex piece of machinery, they could pull up the procedure. If anything ever malfunctioned, we had procedures for that in the cue cards, which they could pull them up. Um, and that increases this autonomy and the um, feeling for the crew that they can really um, do this under a communication delay. If, and if they have a problem, they don't have to wait 30 minutes for a troubleshooting procedure on, on how to fix it from, from the shore. Um, and this is also a really efficient way for the science team back on, on Earth or on the shore um, to iteratively evolve those traverse plans from day to day. So part of the procedure was at the end of every EVA, the science team would go and, and refine the traverse plan for the next day, and we could upload that new traverse plan to the cue card so it was waiting for the, for the astronauts the next day, and which is something that you can't do with, with pen and ink. Um, so from a IV support station or um, IV support sort of workstation um, perspective, we wanted to evaluate what assets the IV crew member would need to be successful in helping the EV crew sort of operate um, on uh, operate their traverse plan. Um, so this is Matthias. He's one of the European astronauts who was a crew member last year. And for that particular EVA, he was this IV person and he had to monitor all of these things at one time. Um, the EVAs are, are about four hours long, so he's sitting at that desk for four hours helping the EV crew to, to operate the plan and, and um, get the data from the science team as, as it evolves. Um, so we want to learn what they need to be successful. How many monitors is too many monitors? Is there a monitor where you can put multiple things on one monitor so you, don't, you can minimize the sort of desk space that the, the IV crew needs? Um, and what we really have learned from NEMO and from the um, rover tests before it is that this IV role is absolutely crucial. Um, they're really, really critical, especially under a time delay in helping the EV crew be successful. Um, and the reason for that is that under a time delay, um, I've sent a message up to the crew and it doesn't get there for 15 minutes. What if they're involved in something really detailed with their, you know, with the, that they're doing on the surface when that communication comes through? They get kind of annoyed when someone's squawking in their ear that was something that was relevant 15 minutes ago um, that they're getting when they're busy. But having this IV hub as someone who can receive that communication and when there's a minute, when there's a down minute, they can pass it on to the EV crew is really important. Um, especially when we're doing reef exploration where the coral scientists are saying, oh, we want that coral, we want that coral, pick that one. Um, we can use this IV person as a way to streamline that communication. And the way we do that is through assets like this that are displayed on these computers. So this is actually the mission log um, that the IV crew member sees. So this is a communication I wrote last year to Matthias. Um, and what it says is basically, we saw this view in one of the EV crew's cameras, you know, half an hour ago. We screenshotted it, drew a box around it and said, tell them to go back to where you put this number down and pick up that coral, sample that coral. Um, and we can do that through the IV person. So when Matias sees that come on his screen, he says, okay, go back to where you put down this tag number and then go up an inch and sample there, right? Which is just not possible if you're sending that communication directly to the EV crew member. Um, so we need to explore these assets and figure out um, exactly what the best thing is for this person to have. And then we have the geology sampling system. Um, just a couple of, of photos to show you the types of samples that they could pick up. Um, it enables them to pick up loosely adhered particles on the floor, um, chip samples, as well as to take core samples. Um, so last year we were really able to utilize this system. It worked really well for taking and storing samples, which is relevant for, for doing that and, and curating and storing samples for, for return to Earth in a Mars or Moon environment. We also, just briefly, I'll skim through these, we had IV activities. So um, we had a crew of four last year. Typically during the day, two people would be on an, EV, on an EVA. One person would be supporting them from the IV position, which left the fourth crew member to do things like all of these really exciting IV activities. Um, so we had a number of, of studies, which I, which I won't dwell on, but um, just to highlight a couple, 
Um, this was the timeline tool that NASA Ames deployed for the mission where the crew could keep track of their own timeline and um, you could actually get into procedures from here. Um, so they're, they're testing this playbook timeline tool and they're doing it again this year for NEMO. Uh, Johns Hopkins ran sort of a sensory motor study. Um, really exciting, and I'll, I'll have a slide on it in a bit, is the mini DNA sequencer. Um, so Matthias is there actually sequencing DNA underwater. And two months later, Kate Rubens um, sequenced DNA for the first time in space on ISS. So that was just really exciting to be a part of last year. And this is like really cutting edge science that, that is happening um, on ISS you know, today. Um, we also used a HoloLens, so sort of augmented reality, to figure out um, for crew where they should store and get a piece of gear. So um, in a volume that's small, everything is packed really carefully, which means it's packed really tightly. And sometimes you forget where you put something. Um, but HoloLens can actually enable you to say, okay, 10 days ago, where did I pack this little thing? And you can actually put it on and find it with augmented reality in the habitat. Um, we are also testing um, miniaturized exercise devices. So um, one thing we're finding with long duration space flight is it's really, really important for astronauts to stay fit and stay in shape. And so um, we had an exercise team from, from the Johnson Space Center um, with us. We had a number of European space agency evaluations and we had things like the EVA swab tool, which looks at um, forward contamination by astronauts in a spacesuit to make sure we're not contamin contaminating our working space. Um, here's just a highlight on the DNA sequencing. So um, all the crew members were able to get through it last year. Reed was very excited. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> um, so we had uh, members of the, the mini ion DNA sequencing team down in Florida with us last year. Um, here's Kate after she successfully sequenced DNA in space for the first time. Um, she's, she was actually a molecular biologist by training, so this is really a cool thing for, for her to be able to actually get to do. Um, so this was just a real highlight of last year um, and uh, to working out the procedures and, and how to use it operationally in a flight-like environment during NEMO uh, actually prepares, so there's Matthias using it in NEMO, prepared um, uh, Kate to be able to do it in space. So that was NEMO 21. Um, briefly, I'll skim through, what time is it? How much time? 12.15, okay. Um, so NEMO 22 is coming up this summer. Um, so I'll just briefly highlight some of the things we're gonna be doing that, that builds on the success of NEMO 21. Um, one is we're gonna take cores with a new breakaway Corbett technology that was developed by Honeybee Robotics, which um, builds a lot of the drills for the Mars rovers. So they're drilling experts. And so we're playing with this new breakaway Corbett technology and, and deploying it in again, a mission flight-like environment. Um, and it has relevancy to that geology sampling system, just with a, sort of a new um, core technology. And it's got a lot of curation implications for, for future sample storage on Mars. Um, briefly, again, I know this is sort of hard to see, but we're playing with um, tool transport on EVA. Um, so there's a lot of tools to sample corals and also rocks um, on Mars. So um, managing all these tools in an environment where if you drop something, it'll float away is a non-trivial issue. Um, so what we were finding last year is there were some frustrations with managing, for example, um, to sample corals, you can um, chip them away or drill them away, and then you have to put them in these small syringes. And you would imagine you're doing something with both your hands, where are you going to put the syringe? You can't just put it down because it'll float away. Um, so managing all these tiny little tools um, becomes a non-trivial problem. Um, so we're playing with equipment transport and storage this year, and the EVA tools group um, at JSC has done just an outstanding job with thinking through this, um, what we're calling a modular equipment transport system that's stored in this cart that the crew has to pull around with them while they're on EVA and store all of these sampling technologies. Um, one thing I'm really excited about is um, I look at um, instruments to, for astronauts to use on Mars, so something that they'd hold in their hand to actually analyze the rocks real time. We have analogs for those underwater. Um, so we have sort of two instruments that we're deploying this year to look at the photosynthetic state um, uh, and the uh, metabolic state of corals. Um, so we're actually deploying those instruments this year as well. And they can all, they all this stuff will fit both on the cart and on the um, astronauts themselves through a wrist storage unit and a leg storage unit. So they can um, pull out a syringe from their wrist without having to carry it long distances from the cart. So this is sort of the, the um, operating strategy for every EVA. And again, um, this was all sort of thought up and, and then constructed by this, the EVA tools group that actually you know, builds tools for human space flight. Um, so the crew will egress from the Aquarius habitat and they'll head to the staging area where their cart, their uh, modular equipment transport system is waiting for them. 
Um, they'll arrive at the staging area and pick the modules from the staging area that they know they're going to need for that EVA. So if today's a day where I need to deploy the instruments, I'm going to make sure I get the instrument modules and put them on the cart because I need them for that day. Um, you traverse through all these coral towers and get to your zone where you're going to be exploring that day, which the science team has suggested as a plan for that day. Um, and here are potentially in zone A is three sites of interest where we think the science team thinks they might um, be able to find interesting coral colonies. Um, and they'll take the cart with them to the, to the zone and then take those small modules with them to each site so they don't have to drag this big honking heavy cart with them wherever they go. Um, then they'll collect their samples, return to the cart, and then return to the staging area at the end of the EVA. So here's just um, type, some of the types of the tools that the, the tools group has, has worked on and the modules that we're going to be using. Um, we've got a drill for sampling coral. Um, one of the things that I thought has been really interesting is this pre-sampling module. So if you have a crew member who gets to a zone that they've never been to before, they take these little tags, um, these little tags which are about this big, um, and they'll walk around the zone um, and actually put down a tag every time they think there might be a coral of interest, and then they can come back later and pick the most compelling samples from those couple that they've, they've temporary tagged. Um, so we have the small tool module for the little dexterous tools that you need to actually put the coral in the syringes, um, and then you have the actual syringes themselves and where they're stored. Um, so these are some of the types of modules that I'm talking about that go in this cart. Um, for the IV support system this year, um, we're evaluating a couple different tools that will be run, running in the background of some of these monitors that the IV person is responsible for monitoring. Um, we also want to minimize, I mean, this is ridiculous, like, you know, this is, this is crazy for the IV person to have to pay attention to what the ground control team is telling them and what the EV crew is telling them. Um, so we're trying to minimize the number of computers and monitors that are required for this IV person to, to, to handle. Um, but, you know, what we're finding is that all of this software is just, is vital to, um, you know, both mission safety and the scientific success of a mission. So we're playing with the types of um, software that the IV person needs to be running. For a science perspective, um, we're retrieving the coral cards from both of the nurseries. We call them the Mercury and At Atlas nurseries, where the crew is going to retrieve all the cards, transport the cards, um, and you know document any that may have died off, and potentially sample them if the science team deems it's necessary. Um, they then they'll they'll take them back, do the documentation and the potential sample sampling, and then they'll return the coral cards back to the nursery um, and reconfigure the cards in sort of this way. So what what's what it's been done before is that. Each arm of the coral nursery has the cards hanging down off of them. Um, the, cor the Coral Restoration Foundation found that they actually want to flip them up and mount them in a more stable configuration. Um, and that's one of the results from actually being able to do this study. So it's exciting that we're seeing a year later um, sort of a new action that needs to be done for this type of coral nursery. Um, for reef follow-up, we're going to follow up on NEMO 20 and NEMO 21 to create this robust three-year temporal assessment of how the corals do over a three-year period. Um, they, there have actually been disease that's developed throughout the Keys, and one of the um, examples of that disease development is unfortunately around Aquarius. So, um, but it's exciting that we get a chance to potentially help figure out what's going on with this disease development around the Keys. And uh, one of the areas that they're going to do that is, is this year at Nemo around Aquarius. Um, and then they're just going to explore new coral colonies um, that they've already um, sort of sampled from previous years and um, tagged in previous years and resample and look at how they've developed over, over time. And then explore and expand into new sites. Um, so we haven't covered this entire Carpenter Basin over the last couple of years. So we're going to explore into newly explored sites um, and deploy the instruments to measure respiration and photosynthesis using these new instruments. Um, and then we're also going to look at corals as they relate to the, to the colonies that are deployed in the nurseries. Um, I'll skim through these. Um, this, these are just my last couple slides. They're hard to read, so I can read them. Um, these are our science operations objectives, and they're split into four T's, tools, techniques, technology, and training. Um, so for tools, we want to understand how this modular transport system um, relates to science-driven EVAs. Does it help? Does it hurt? How operationally does the crew use it? Um, how is the core sampling tool going to be incorporated? Is it a timeline hit? Is it going to take longer than the alternate methods of, of sampling corals? Um, we're going to look at deploying handheld instruments, like I said, into science-driven EVA, which is not something we've done before. Um, technologies, um, what's the role of informatics, so those digital cue cards, what's the role that they play in science-driven EVAs? Um, what happens if you have a camera mounted for situational awareness? So if I'm working at this computer as an outcrop and there's a camera over here, how useful is that camera for situational awareness for the IV crew member and the mission support team on Earth? 
Um, and again, the role of the IV workstation, because that's not something we've done before um, um, past analog missions like this. Um, flex execution, operational flexibility is really important. So we're going to continue to play with that. And what um, tools and technologies do you need to develop to support this flexible execution? Um, and what does the communication flow look like? I mentioned that's a big deal, especially under communication delays. So playing with the structure of how data flows from one support team to another to the crew um, is something we'll need to continue to test. And then training. We're not only training the astronauts, but we're also training ourselves, the ground team. So anybody who's involved in this test gets a better understanding of a flight-like environment through a test like NEMO. And that's really important to capture those lessons learned as they evolve um, to make sure that when we do this for real, um, we're ready as a ground team and as a crew. Um, and again, just to leave you with a couple thoughts, um, I think for outreach, this is really important. We had a lot of excitement over this um, image last year. Here's the six people who are living in the habitat. They're um, reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Um, and they're, the reason they're wearing these masks is that's what needs to happen when you're in saturation. You want to come back up to the surface. You need to decompress in a specific way. So that's what they're doing here. This is the last day before they came up. Um, we had a lot of social media following. Um, we were excited that Ellen Ochoa, the center director of JSC, got really into it and tweeted something. Um, and one of the things that, that I thought was especially cool about last year was um, the EVA tools group at, at um, Johnson Space Center works with college students from around the country to develop new ideas for sampling in different gravity environments. So every year they run this program, it's called Micro G Next, and they have university students you know, propose these ideas and build these tools for sampling in lower gravity. And one of the tools that one of the groups came up with last year was to build this different type of coring tube. And the EVA tools group liked it so much that they asked and actually used it in email last year. Um, so that was a pretty exciting example of really fast end-to-end -end testing from a university group. Um, and just sort of to leave you with the sort of above and below life, it really is a robust analog project. You can see the LSB, the life support buoy here. This was a day where um, we had two female crew members on EVA, so we staffed Mission Control with all of the women there, which I thought was really neat. Um, a team picture from NEMO 21 last year. Uh, the two NASA astronauts who are crew last year, Reed Weissman and Megan Bankin. Um, and then this is Roger Garcia, who runs the entire facility. Um, and so he really enables all this stuff to, to happen. So I'll leave this and I'll take questions. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you said that the, the IV role was really critical. And this is this is an international group? Uh yeah, there this is an international group. Mm -hmm. an international group. So yeah. we've seen Matias mm -hmm. who's French or German or Mexican. Yeah, German, yeah. German. Yeah, so the question is, um, we work with international partners, and, and is Matthias, the astronaut from last year, is he the only one, or do we have other international participation? We definitely do. Um, so both of the two active Canadian astronauts, David St. Jack and Jeremy Hansen, have been crew members already for NEMO. Um, we've had most, if not all, of the JAXA, the Japanese crew members, been crew members on NEMO. Um, and most of the ESA, the European Space Agency crew members, have gone through already um, and then we also have especially from ESA we've had um, support team members come as well um, so we have the Capcom role which is the traditional role of the person who sits in mission control in Houston that communicates to ISS um, that Capcom role is is um, filled by a rotating cast of cast of um, people for NEMO and we have international Capcoms that come as well um, so we have a lot of international participation with our sort of partner space agencies, and it's been, I think, one of the more successful parts of the mission. It's been exciting to see. In the back. Um, thank you. This is super awful. Oh, good. You, um, you talked about the nurseries, uh, the coral nurseries. What about uh, any kind of prototyping of nurseries for growing food in this underground uh, aquatic? Yeah. Yeah, so lots of questions about food, um, which I love. Um, so how do they, do they grow food and what do they eat? So they don't grow food in Nemo. We've done that with the rats testing, the rover testing. Um, we tested a habitat lab for rats and we actually grew lettuce and ate it at the end. It was delicious. Um, and they're doing that on ISS, of course. They're growing, um, they're growing vegetables or lettuce up on the International Space Station. In fact, I think I saw this morning or yesterday morning, they were eating um, Chinese cabbage. Yeah, um, so... 
Yeah. Um, but what the for here? So the, the tricky one of the tricky things operationally about Nemo um, is getting things underwater is non-trivial. <laughs> um, so getting, for example, if you have a bag of food that's not punctured and you bring that volume of air down sixty feet, it doesn't react very well. Um, so any food that they get down there is, is very carefully prepared. For example, they have to puncture all of their like K cups for coffee before they bring them down. Otherwise, um, so the, they eat, I mean, they don't eat anything out of the ordinary. Um, so they'll eat, um, I think one crew in particular got really into Pringles, um, for what I hear. Um, they'll do dehydrated food. Um, they eat, they eat base, they, they eat pretty normally down there. Yeah. Yes. And you're talking a lot about exciting things to leak the ISS mm-hmm. and hopefully boots on the ground. Could you tell us a little bit about where we are technology wise, the radiation aspects on Mars? And you talked about EVAs that are four hours. If, regardless of how long they were there for a year or two years, could they last for four hours at this current status on what our technology yeah. is? What do we need to do to overcome that so that it's a reality? Yeah. So basically, what are the technological hurdles to doing this in, on Mars? There are a lot. <laughs> radiation, you mentioned, is a huge one. Um, so radiation shielding and protecting from space, wo- space weather is, is, is huge. Um, we, you know, we got lucky with Apollo. We didn't have any major radiation events while the astronauts were on the surface. We can't guarantee that that's going to happen again. So protecting from radiation, uh, especially for the long durations it'll take to get to Mars, stay on Mars, and get back, is extremely non-trivial. Um, so that's a major area of ongoing technology development right now. Um, launch and landing <laughs> is, a, is a big deal as well. So um, landing that much mass on the surface of Mars is, is really challenging. Um, the most we've landed is the um, MSL rover, the Curiosity rover that's, that's up there right now. And we did that with this incredibly complex and really cool sky crane technology where it sort of um, braked and then um, thrusters fired and it hovered above the ground and a crane actually lowered down the rover, which like blows my mind every time we think, think about we did that successfully. Um, but the, the mass required for, for human habitation is you know, orders of magnitude larger than that rover. Um, So figuring out how to, you know, get human beings to Mars and land them safely um, is another ongoing area of research. Um, Of course, um, you may have heard in the news about the SLS rocket launch system, this um, the heavy heavy launch vehicle that NASA is developing. That's an uh, ongoing um, area of research that we that NASA is heavily involved in right now. Um, So from a big picture, you know, we have the rockets, we have we have launch and landing, we have radiation, um, we have human health for long term space flight. So what is it? What happens to a human body when they're in, in low gravity for that long? Um, so that those are sort of the big picture questions that that NASA is, is doing a really good job of investigating right now from a geology standpoint, um, which is the stuff that, that I spend my days thinking about. Um, a lot of the stuff I mentioned, even though Nemo is underwater and they're looking at corals, is incredibly relevant. Um, operationally, you know, yes, we've done this before. Like we, you know, humans collected a lot of really interesting science samples from Apollo, but um, technology has come a long way since then. And hopefully when human beings do this for real, they'll have more robust instruments that they're able to use. And figuring out how to incorporate those into EVA is is important. Figuring out how to design the hardware and software for EVA is important. And um, that's, you know, the types of people that I work with are working on that right now. Um, so I do not claim to be any, a member of their team. I was thrilled to work with them next to them, but I'm definitely not on the team for that. But to, to answer your question as best I can, which was about, you know, operating the, the mini DNA sequencer, um, it's this, they basically, um, get the sample and the, the instrument itself is like this big. Um, and they actually feed the sample in and it runs, I mean, pretty quickly in a matter of an hour or two. Um, at least the, the, the sequences they were running on Nemo last year. And they do, they download the data locally, and then they have to send it up in a big chunk. Yeah. As a diver, I'm just curious about the decompression. Mm-hmm. Does it take 15 to 15 minutes is the longest yeah. that they say? Is well, I, I don't know if that's the longest ever. That was what Nemo 21 was. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if that was because of decompression or was if there was more effect of that. Nope, that was, um, so why the 16-day duration in terms of um, saturation diving? Um, definitely not the limit. It was just what we had available to us in terms of scheduling for, for NASA last year. 
I'm pretty sure there have been longer missions. It, it's not have to, it doesn't have to do with with um, saturate the saturation limits at all. Um, we do have to be careful, um, and and they have this down to an absolute science at this facility. Um, we don't want to go too deep on the EVAs for too long. So um, planning the EVAs revolves, of course, around safety first. And so um, the the crew at the Aquarius Reef Base Shore Facility basically gives us our unbreakable flight rules, and they monitor every EVA to make sure the crews aren't staying too deep too long. Are they all trained divers? Yes. Oh, yes. Saturation divers, too. They go through special saturation dive training. Great. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.